Overall, I think it's fair to say that, I mean, most economies outperformed. So this is not just an emerging market thing. I think overall the global economy has been more resilient than we than we thought six, seven months ago. We've seen consumption, private consumption particularly, has been pretty robust and that has been supported, I think, by labor markets. You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of subjects that matter most to business leaders. To help make sense of these topics, we sit down with thought leaders and do what we do best at the Conference Board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board and the host of this series. And in today's conversation, we're going to discuss emerging markets. How have they been faring so far this year? What can we expect for the rest of 2023 and into 2024? And then what's going to drive their longer term growth? Joining me today is Klaus DeVries, the Senior Economist at the Conference Board. Klaus, welcome. Thank you very much, Steve. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, Klaus, you have to remind everybody, what's an emerging market versus de- a developed market? Sure, it's important to have that straight. So, an emerging market, I think the best way to think of it is as a, it's a sort of separate class within the developing economies. It's a bit of a faster growing, typically, than, than a developing economy. They're not yet... Uh, rich. They're also not really poor, um, and they have some kind of openness to the to the global economy in terms of trade and uh, and, and and capital and, and things like that. So, it, it, is it fair to say you've got developed markets, and that's you know like the United States, Northern uh, North America, Western Europe, developed, and then you have developing, which is you know really undeveloped, very poor countries, and then these emerging markets, which are growing faster. So they're like the top end of the developing markets. Is that a good way to think about it? That's probably, yeah, that's probably a good way. Yeah. And, and so give us some examples of some of the countries that uh, would be considered emerging markets. Yeah. So, I mean, there's not a definite list. Uh, that's that's important to, to keep in mind. And, and some people, you know, they have different different criteria. So there's overall, there's a bit of a discussion on some countries, but I think overall, broadly speaking, you should think of countries like uh, Brazil or Mexico uh, or China, India, Indonesia, uh, South Africa, Turkey, Russia. Those kind of countries are typically considered uh, emerging economies. Great. Okay. So so these are big economies and uh, you just roughly in total, what what percentage of the global GDP do these economies make up? Um, well, it depends a bit on how you count it. Um, if you use exchange rates, you will get a bigger share for richer countries, but it's a bit more common to use uh, purchasing power parities, which, uh, uh, which give a bit of a bigger share to uh, emerging economies. At the moment, it's, it's broadly 50-50 between developing and uh, developed. And I would say emerging is probably, I don't know, about 30, 40% of global GDP, something in that in that area, probably more 40, I would say. Yeah, Yeah, it's the majority of the uh, of the uh, developing nations. OK, so this is a big group. I mean, 40 percent. It's it's almost half the uh, half the global economy. So that's why we look at this, because they're they're faster growing and, you know, their health is really important to the global GDP health. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're about halfway through 2023. How are these economies doing? Yeah, the, I would say it's it's fairly benign, actually, the, the the overall outlook. Obviously, it's a very big group with a lot of differences between uh, the economies. Um, but overall, I think when we last talked uh, about half a year ago, we had we still had expected emerging markets to outperform the global economy, but we still expected them to to slow down a bit, um, but overall, so far, I think we've seen all of the data has exceeded expectations. Uh, also, for the ones where we were uh, a bit less optimistic, particularly for example, Brazil or Turkey, uh, we've seen quite some up, some uh, some some upside surprises. So, just to give you a perspective, for example, uh, half a year ago, we were expe- uh, expecting for this year aggregate growth of about 3.5%. Uh, 
and currently we're at 3.9 percent. So, it's, so it, it may not sound like much, but it's actually uh, it's but it, it's it's a pretty significant uh, significant upgrade. And it was particularly strong in, for example, Latin America, um, where we had be better better data releases, uh, and also some other Asian economies, India, Indonesia, Philippines, um, and actually also Russia and Turkey. They surprised a bit to the upside. So the total, so if, uh, in the first half of 2023, total global GDP growth has been two, two and a half, right in that range, right? So a little bit above that, yeah. A little bit above. So, but the, and so these folks are growing, you know, significantly higher than that. So in some ways, this is the engine of growth for the globe. Yes, yeah, that's a good point. Well, they have been for a while already, uh, but particularly for this year. Uh, where we're seeing much slower growth in Europe, much slower growth in the US, uh, the, the, diff the difference is, is bigger even. And they're driving grow global growth for, for a great deal. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so their growth has exceeded your forecasts, as you've mentioned. And um, how what, what accounts for that beat, if you will, or that excess uh, over your forecast? Yeah. Well, overall, I think it's fair to say that I mean, most economies outperformed. So this is not just an emerging market thing. I think overall the global economy has been more resilient than we than we thought six, seven months ago. We've seen consumption, private consumption particularly, has been pretty robust. And that has been supported, I think, by labor markets, which are quite positive. We still have you know a lot of savings, consumers sitting on a lot of savings. Uh, obviously, we know the story for the US. Uh, also in Europe, this is the case. The, the, there's less detailed data available for emerging markets, but if you, you know, there's some some proxy data available, and they point to similar dynamics. So, um, so that's obviously you know driving consumption, and overall, I think there's 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 a big boost from the normalization of the shocks that we've seen over uh, 2020 to 2022. And um, so you can particularly see that in the service sector activity and, and in a lot of emerging economies, particularly in Asia, you should think of things like tourism, uh, which is a, the biggest spillover from, from China's reopening in that region. And overall, I think also still an ongoing normalization in uh, mobility, uh, which was quite depressed uh, earlier, obviously, during 2020, 2022. So those are yeah some factors that we had foreseen that to drive growth, but they just turned out to be a bit stronger than than we than we thought. And then I think it's also important there were some unforeseen uh, positive surprises. Um, for example, in Brazil there was a record harvest, so that sounds like a bit strange, but that really drove the, the, the aggregate growth rate for that country quite a bit up. Uh, also for India, we were generally a bit more. Uh, pessimistic, but there was a very strong, particularly service exports, uh, that boosted growth. So there were some, I guess, some you could say some one-offs as well that uh, that we hadn't anticipated that it happened. You mentioned you know China's reopening. Um, China is obviously the bit the, well the, the second largest economy in the world, and so therefore they're the largest um, emerging market here. And so that, but that reopening was pretty significant here. To describe what happened there and which sectors contributed yeah yeah that that was and and it still is i think one of the big stories for this year one of the big global growth drivers given the depressed levels of consumption particularly services activity in, in china last year um we have seen so far a very pronounced rebound given you know how deep they were last year but I think overall, what is becoming clear now, and, and we have been saying that actually for a while already, but overall it's becoming clear that it's, you know, it is a it is a rebound, you know, going back to the, you know, the the, the, the normal, but it doesn't seem to be a very strong sort of sustained uh, uh, rebound in the sense that, you know, that's overall, you know, the growth of about 5% for China, that's the expectation for this year. Uh, that's, you know, not very strong if you look at it uh, from a historical perspective uh, in terms of a rebound year in that sense. So so a bit of a mixed story, I guess, on one hand, yes, big positive. But on the other hand, it's a bit of a um, sort of growth with the, with the handbrake on, if you, if you will. So it's it's not a it's a bit of a subdued rebound in that sense. Yeah. But, you know, if, if you think back, um, the, the closures due to COVID 
extended in China, you know, longer than anywhere else. I mean, you know, really through yeah. fall and winter of last year. And so therefore, you know, there was the service sector was really throttled down. I mean, people couldn't go to restaurants or, you know, those entertainment and those sorts of things. So as that opened up, I mean, those sectors just boomed, right? Yeah, exactly. And that that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a normalization. But some of the factors that were also depressing growth last year, like particularly the housing sector, I mean, those problems have not gone away. So that is also one of the reasons why it's still sort of a, a relatively overall subdued uh, rebound. Just, well, describe that housing sector thing, because that, that, that's, that's been a huge thing, but uh, I, I'm not sure it's clear how, the, you know, what's happening and how it's impacting China. So, the, yeah, maybe we should take a small step back. So the overall, the housing sector, the real estate sector has been a big driver uh, in growth in China uh, over the last decade, decades, actually. Um, but at the same time, there were a lot of signs that um, there was increasingly speculation and increasingly, you know, if you look at uh, the the house prices uh, relative to income, they were, you know, they were getting at very high levels. So what the government did at some point, they cracked down on that. They wanted to, uh, uh, you know, they, they didn't want a huge bubble to to emerge and then that, you know, and, and if, if that pops, then, you know, you have a big crisis. So they wanted to manage uh, um that uh, that 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 housing uh, you know housing activity a little bit but in the end we did see house prices come down quite a bit uh, there have been some um this was, this was i think it was in 2021 or 22 where some big real estate developers started getting into trouble uh, there was a lot in the news back then um and overall we still see that this housing activity uh, is still very very subdued at the moment. Um, it has, I think it has stabilized a little bit, but overall prices are still in the negative territory. Um, real estate investment is also still uh, relatively negative. So th- there, uh, yeah, again, that, that's, I think that's one of the key uh, uh, drivers of their sort of bit of a subdued, subdued outlook. Yeah. So that's slowing them down a little bit. And so we're, you know, we're projecting, what five a little over five percent growth there yeah yeah exactly yeah. yeah close to the government targets which i think is also around five percent around five yeah. percent and and that's that's you know that's pretty high compared to you know the uh the mature economies which are growing you know at one to two percent but still you know they've got so far to go and it's so far below historical growth rates that it it you know it feels a little sluggish because of that right yeah, I mean, they were slowly coming down already before the pandemic, but I mean, they were still growing at 6 7%. And mind you, again, as I said, it's, it's supposed to be a rebound year. In 2021, for example, when they rebounded from 2020, they grew by over 8%. So again, in that light, 5% is relatively uh, relatively subdued. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. So what's your projection then for you know the rest of the year for emerging markets in total and into 24? Yeah, I think overall we're we see we see uh, ongoing resilience. I think overall uh, in domestic activity, uh, you know, of course, some of the reopening boost that we talked about that that is you know that will slightly fade obviously over time. Um, but at the same time, there are some factors that could offset that weakening in in services activity. Uh, for example, uh, the in- global industry sector has been doing very, very poorly over the last, um, well, not last, last year, and there are some signs that that that's starting to turn. So that could provide some uh, some offset. But overall, I think, yeah, we are for this year. As I said, we're at three point nine percent for next year, about three point eight percent. So all in all, uh, you know, just under four percent for. Um, for this year and next um in terms of in terms of recessions i don't think there's any large emerging markets that have really flashing sort of recession signals but i think it's important to keep in mind there's you know there's big difference between these uh emerging markets or some for example particularly the asian emerging markets also india they're more on the high end of the growth of, of the sort of the growth spectrum and other economies, particularly Latin America, they're much more on the lower end of the spectrum. And uh, 
some countries in, uh, for example, in Africa or or Turkey are sort of a little bit in the middle of that of that spectrum. We're discussing the state of emerging markets in 2023 and the projections into 2024. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Are you ready to transform your business and stay ahead of the competition? Artificial intelligence is quietly reshaping the global economy, optimizing manufacturing processes, and transforming how users interact with popular platforms. Harnessing the power of AI can exponentially enhance your business's effectiveness and efficiency. However, navigating the risks associated with this transformative technology is critical. Privacy, integrity, the economy, and humanity are all at stake. That's why the Conference Board is your go-to resource for the expertise and foresight you need to leverage AI to its fullest potential and make strategic moves that propel your business forward. Unlock the possibilities AI offers your business. Visit tcb.org slash AI today to access trusted insights for what's ahead and guidance on navigating the AI transformation. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odden from the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by Klaus Debris, our senior economist at the Conference Board. So, Klaus, the projections are that, you know, you were saying, you know, 3.9, 3.8 for the next couple of years, but there are, you know, some emerging markets growing faster, and there's some emerging markets that are struggling and maybe even recession, you know, just run through the garden on this and who's doing what. Sure. Yeah. So as I said, I think at the moment there's not, you know, not a clear indication that countries will go into recession. I think the overall domestic activity is still, you know, still holding up relatively well. Um, but definitely we see some economies slowing more than others, uh, particularly in Latin America, Brazil, uh, Mexico. Uh, we're seeing some slowing there uh, and other Latin American economies too. Um, Turkey is also a case where um, where we see a, a much slower growth environment in going forward. Uh, Russia, uh, also another, it's a bit of a special case, obviously, given the whole situation. But overall, it's also an economy where, uh, where we see very modest growth uh, for this year. Um, and the same holds for South Africa, where we're also seeing a bit more subdued growth. So those are yeah some of the countries that are on the lower sort of on the lower spectrum. So it was projected earlier that Turkey, Russia, South Africa would all experience recessions. Is, are we are we still projecting that or not? Uh, no, we're not seeing outright recessions, uh, but yeah, rather just very subdued growth. I think that's, that's a more uh, uh, accurate description, yeah. Okay. All right. So still the number one economy in the world is the U.S. And we are projecting that the U.S. will experience a recession, right, um, towards the back half of this year into next year. We're projecting it to be relatively mild and short, but it, a recession nonetheless. So how does the U.S. economy then impact emerging markets, if at all? Yeah. So overall, as always, it's a bit of a, a bit of a cliche, but it depends on the country, obviously. But overall, I think we should see a relatively limited impact uh, from the U.S. recession. As you mentioned, it's we're it's you know it's in, uh, expected to be relatively mild. It's also widely anticipated by now. Uh, we've been saying it for a while, but I think at the moment, most economists, most you know, or consumers or business are expecting it. So it's widely expected in that sense. It's not going to be a big, uh, big or the surprising element will be the strength of it, obviously. And also, as I said, we see domestic activity as currently in a lot of emerging markets being a big driver. So, uh, so those I think are all factors that speak for a little bit of a subdued uh, impact. Yeah, and, and so therefore, then you know, it's really going to be dependent on their own economies, right, and and their trade with others. So, um, uh, we talked a little bit about China and their rebound from the COVID closures, especially in service sectors. But what, in general, will be the key growth uh, the key growth drivers uh, across emerging markets? Overall, as I said, I think it's. Domestic activity is going to be one of the key drivers. We have seen 
uh, inflation coming down. Maybe we'll talk a bit more in a, in a minute about it. Uh, we still see saving buffers that have not been depleted yet. Uh, labor markets are still relatively uh, relatively strong. Um, the overall fundamentals with, uh, of of emerging markets in terms of uh, you know currency stability, financial stability, those kind of uh, factors have improved. I think over the last couple of years. Um, so that speaks to overall, you know, overall relatively relatively strong position for emerging markets. Um, and in terms of sectors, uh, yeah, also, as I said earlier, I think services will continue to be a driver in going forward, uh, although, you know, somewhat more moderate than, than, than we saw uh, over the last half year. And also, I think for the industrial sector, which has been uh, a bit more negative in many economies, uh, we should see some, uh, some upside uh, uh, momentum there, uh, or at least that's what we're expecting, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting your point on consumer savings. Uh, you know, in many emerging markets, you know, consumer credit is not as widely available as the mature economies. And so, you know, there's a much more dependence on cash and savings than there is on consumer credit, right? So talk about that because that, you know, I think people were able to, well, they spent less because they there was less to spend on, you know, <laughs> when the economies were closed during the pandemic. But but you know there was a pile of savings that uh, that households amassed in emerging markets. Yeah, I mean overall, the the lockdowns were a bit less severe, I think, in most emerging uh, markets compared to other other economies. But still, there were definitely were lockdowns. Um, sometimes once, twice, three times. So definitely, there's been a buildup of, uh, uh, of of a lot of a lot of savings in that sense. Yeah, so we so that that becomes available then once you know now that things are relatively back to normal. So okay, so inflation is uh, obviously a a you know a, a sticky subject in the mature nations. We see the the EU and um, the UK, of course, and the US central banks taking aggressive actions. What is it like in emerging markets? Yeah, some similarities, some differences. Overall, the similarities are that uh, inflation has been trending down, and as you know, it's at least for now it seems to be past its peak for a while already. And also, core inflation is a bit more sticky. Uh, although I think the problem in advanced economies is, is probably a bit more uh, uh, a bit more uh, pronounced. But overall, where the big difference is, I think, is with the uh, central bank action. As you mentioned, indeed, uh, ECB, the European Central Bank, uh, Bank of England, uh, other, you know, other mature, the Fed, obviously, and other um, mature economy central banks, they have been uh, quite aggressive, actually, uh, uh, lately, and expecting to continue to tighten monetary policy further also in their language you can see that they're very uh they're still very concerned about the inflation outlook if you read through the communication of the emerging market central banks or at least you know again the, the biggest you see a very different picture and you see a picture where a lot of them have already uh, paused their rate hikes uh um for a long time or they switch to very smaller smaller increments and for some, there's already uh, uh, widely anticipation that uh, there will be uh, cuts in interest rates, perhaps in the next couple of months or towards the end of this year or either uh, early next year. So, so th that's a big difference uh, uh, with with advanced economies. Yeah, yeah, and China is is the example of that, right? They, their central bank is is easing. Yeah, well, China in inflation is a bit of a different case i guess because they they have they are seeing very subdued inflation right very below target actually where for the other emerging markets inflation has been coming closer to their target ranges so in terms of china yeah they are trying to yeah, they're trying to stimulate it again a little bit to bring inflation up so whereas for the others it's more of a normalization of bringing you know very, coming from very high interest rates trying to bring them down uh, uh to more normal levels yeah yeah so you know it's uh it, it's interesting that these these nations are often quite small and yet they they have their own central bank and their own currency it's uh 
you know, it's really remarkable that uh, that they're able to manage, you know, because of that even still, you know, while we have we think of it as a completely globally interconnected economy, it's you know, there's a lot of you know distinct decisions being made. Yeah, but mind you, there's there's a lot of interconnectedness, right? Particularly the the Federal Reserve, what they are doing. That I mean, it's followed very closely across the world. It has impacts throughout. Um, and also a lot of countries have their currencies backed to the US dollar. So in that sense, you know, there's, you could argue there's a bit of a limited sense of, uh, you know, what they can do on their own. But yeah, on the other hand, yes, I mean, they, it's not that they're completely dependent on, on the Fed. They have some, some room, uh, uh for maneuver, uh, as well, obviously. Yeah. Um, you know, another issue is obviously labor markets. Uh, in in the West and in uh, mature economies, labor is very tight. You know, it's hard to find, and uh, you know what you find is very expensive. How is it in emerging markets? Yeah, it's uh, it's relatively similar. Uh, I would say it's uh, overall the the global labor market uh, is, is 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 very tight. Uh, also, in emerging markets, unemployment rates are very low. Uh, compared to their history, either at record low levels or in a very sort of low low band, and that, as you say, points to a very uh, very tight labor supply situation. So there's a smaller pool where where business can uh, can 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 pick workers from. And on the other hand, we see uh, demand for labor also still pretty strong. Um, and again, it's the same as uh, in in the US and Europe. Even though maybe there's there's some slowing going on, but still, I mean, overall demand is still growing relatively relatively strong. Just very briefly, there, as always, you know, there are some regional differences, some some country differences. For example, in uh, in China, we do see the overall unemployment rate is very low, but uh, the youth unemployment rate, for example, is very high. So there's some, there, yeah, there's some some issues there. I think uh, again, pointing to the overall relatively weak economic rebound, uh, but also some structural issues in terms of skill mismatches. So the, you know, the, the, the graduates uh, that are coming out of the education system are not necessarily the ones that, uh, that, that, that the, the business sector needs. And then on the positive side, I think um, many people will not know this perhaps, but in, in, in India, which is, you know, obviously seen as a, country with a large population, growing population, large young population, actually over the last 10 years, uh, last 10, 15 years, uh, they haven't really benefited that much economically in terms of uh, this this population growth, because we've seen participation rates actually uh, gradually come down there. However, interestingly, over the last three years, three, four years, we have seen participation rates come up, actually. So, uh, so that's actually a relatively positive development uh, that perhaps is not not very well known. Um, so again, as I said, there are some differences between between important differences between countries between uh, between demographics and and things like that. But overall, the picture is of a relatively strong and uh, relatively tight labor market. Yeah. So last question to wrap up. Uh, any other points that? Uh that you want to bring out as it relates to, you know, the projections that we have not discussed? Sure. Well, we, we haven't really talked a lot about the longer term prospects um, and what are, what are some of the driving forces? I think very briefly overall, I think the overall backdrop is where is one where we see the global economy slowing a little bit over the next decade, as it has been slowing over the last couple of years. And that is also visible in, uh, in in emerging markets, even though the, the drivers are a bit different. For some, it's uh, aging demographics. Uh, for others, it's weak productivity growth. So it depends a bit. But overall, we see a sort of slowing trend. But at the same time, uh, and this is also a theme we, we talked a bit about earlier, we do st still continue to see emerging markets outperform the overall global economy. Um, because also most other economies are actually on this slowing trend. Okay, great. Klaus Degree, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Steve. And thanks to all of you for listening into CEO Perspectives. Every week I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader to provide insights on the issues of our time. We'll cover the leading topics in geopolitics, economics, public policy, ESG, and more. 
Please share CEO perspectives with all of your colleagues, all of your friends, everyone that you know in emerging markets. I know they're going to want to listen. I'm Steve Odlin, and this series has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You have been listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board.